Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, in the previous few videos, we've been talking about bifurcations, one of the coolest things in all of dynamical systems theory. And in particular, we looked at saddle node bifurcations and transcritical bifurcations. Now, we're going to round that off with a third kind of bifurcation today, and that is a pitchfork bifurcation. Now, pitchfork bifurcations are very, very special in the theory of dynamical systems because they require symmetry. Now, symmetry is not something that most systems actually exhibit, especially in nature, right? Symmetry is only something that is approximate, but it doesn't matter in this case. We can still look at what's happening with these pitchfork bifurcations, and we can always approximate these symmetries as definite symmetries in dynamical systems. As you're going to see in the next video, you get the ghost of these symmetries sort of coming through anyways. So if you feel that this is slightly restrictive to look at symmetric bifurcations, uh, I will urge you to understand that these things do come up very much in dynamical systems theory. Now, let's take a look. Pitchfork bifurcations are very strange. And they're strange for uh, they're strange for the reason that they come in two varieties, okay? There is something called a supercritical pitchfork bifurcation and a subcritical pitchfork bifurcation, okay? Let me start with supercritical because it's the really fun one. All right, so Rx minus x cubed, all right. So no quadratic term, and it kind of does something that I've been neglecting in the past few videos, right? It goes up to the cubic order. I've been always forgetting about the cubic order. But the reason I've been doing that is because there's always a quadratic term to catch me in the Taylor expansion. Here, no quadratic term. And the symmetry that I was talking about is this is an odd dynamical system, okay? It only has odd powers. Now, let's take a look at what some of the phase line diagrams are going to look like here, okay? So, for r less than zero, there is only one fixed point of this thing, and it's at zero. So, let's do the phase line diagram, right? I'm going to skip a lot of the steps here because I think that you're probably getting good at this by now. But you have a stable fixed point at zero. So, let's do zero. Then for r equal to zero, you still only have a single fixed point. And very strangely enough, because of the symmetry, you still get stability. Okay, kind of weird, right? Remember I told you pitchforks are weird. And if r is bigger than zero, this thing now has three roots to it. In particular, zero becomes unstable. And these two branches, the square root of r plus or minus the square root of r, take its stability. Okay, so first thing you can see here is we have symmetry in the system. Okay, so you get this sort of flip symmetry that's always happening in your dynamical system. That is the odd symmetry coming through in your supercritical bifurcation, pitchfork bifurcation. Now, what else happens? You go from one fixed point to three, okay? It's different than the saddle node. It's different than the transcritical. Remember, transcritical is going from zero to two. Transcritical is two to two. Pitchfork is one to three. And these ones show up related by symmetry. So if you do a bifurcation diagram, So a bifurcation diagram here. Well, what should we expect? I've got, remember I put this in the Rx plane. X equal to zero is always a solution and it's stable for all negative values of R and it becomes unstable for positive values of R. Okay, I'm not gonna write stable and unstable on here anymore. Solid line means stable, dashed line means unstable. So x equal to zero is stable when r is negative. It is unstable when r is positive. And then you get these two fixed points that emerge that are symmetrically related. And both of those are stable. And hopefully with that poorly drawn picture, 
you understand why it's called a pitchfork bifurcation, right? It kind of looks like a little pitchfork that's emerging here, right? I've got three little arms and my handle. Nothing too fancy, right? It's a relatively simple bifurcation. The beautiful part here is that you have two stable fixed points that emerge and they are symmetrically related, right? The odd symmetry of X means you can flip over the R axis here and everything remains invariant, okay? So let's take a look at an example. Let's see where we might find a pitchfork bifurcation out in the wild. Let's look at a really, really simple, fun model. And this is negative x plus beta hyperbolic tangent of x. Now, I didn't just make this model up because I thought it would be a cute model or uh, maybe difficult, maybe keep you on your toes with the hyperbolic tangent. This is actually a very, very famous model and it's used a lot of the time to model networks of neurons. Now that's not neural networks, right? That's not the sort of machine learning craze that's sort of sweeping the idea. It's the idea behind neural networks. That is the, ne the neurons that govern, you know, all processes that your brain undertakes. Typically, functions that look like this are used to understand the dynamics of a single neuron. We can link a whole bunch of these together through sort of coupling mechanisms that are a little bit beyond the scope of this problem right here, but nonetheless, uh, to, to sort of generate dynamics, you know, across large macroscopic regions of the brain. But this is just a sort of simple phenomenon for a single neuron in the brain, right? Just one single neuron. The state of that neuron is given by X. We have a bifurcation parameter in here, beta. That would be a sort of response uh, that the neuron can, uh, can determine on its own. Now, first thing I want you to know, X equal to zero is always a fixed point. So if you were doing this completely fresh and you didn't know that this lecture was about uh, saddle node bifurcations, uh, sorry, pitchfork bifurcations, what you could do is you could immediately rule out that a saddle node bifurcation takes place anywhere in this model because you always have a fixed point. You never have nothing. You don't have the emergence of something anywhere. This basically says if a bifurcation is going to happen here, it's either going to be transcritical or a pitchfork. Now, of course, you know, I started talking about pitchforks, so clearly it's going to be a pitchfork, but let's take a look. So let's linearize. Let's linearize around this fixed point. Remember, linearizing means taking the derivative of the right-hand side and evaluating it at zero. So that's f prime of zero. We did this to determine the stability of a fixed point. So this is going to be minus one plus beta. And the derivative of the hyperbolic tangent, you might have to look this one up. I certainly did whenever I did this, but it's actually one minus the hyperbolic tangent squared and then evaluated at zero. And so that's equal to zero. And this gives me a nice beta minus one. Now, essentially what this tells me is that x equal to zero is stable when beta is less than one, and x equal to zero is unstable when beta is greater than one. So the question is, you know, what happens, right? What does the bifurcation look like in this actual bifurcation diagram or in this system? Well, next thing that we could do is we could plot this thing. So we could plot to visualize, plot y equal to x uh, against, uh, sorry, against y equal to beta hyperbolic tangent and look for intersections. All right, the sort of graphical method of finding fixed points here. Well, there's really only sort of two things that happen. So let's take a look at this. So we have y equal to x looking like this. It doesn't change. 
Now, essentially all beta does is it expands or contracts this hyperbolic tangent function. And one possibility is when beta is small, you get this. So again, you can use your favorite plotter if you want. You can use uh, maybe Desmos or Wolfram Alpha, Maple, MATLAB, Mathematica, whatever it happens to be. But in this case, this is essentially when beta is less than one, okay? You can see there's a single fixed point and we already saw that it's gonna be stable. Now, similarly, Beta could really, really open this thing up. And Beta could be way bigger and this would open and it would look something like this. And I would get one, two, three fixed points. Okay, this is for Beta larger than one. So what does that tell me? It tells me that a pitchfork bifurcation took place, right? Again, I can do the, the Taylor series expansion around x equal to zero and beta equal to one. I can do the normal form transformations that I did for transcritical. But here, you know, I just use a simple sort of graphical method and I can see that I've got a pitchfork happening. Pitchfork bifurcation taking place in the system. One stable fixed point undergoes a super critical pitchfork bifurcation, which gives way to its own in instability and leads to two symmetrically related fixed points. The reason I knew that I was gonna have a pitchfork in here and not necessarily a transcritical is because this is an odd equation. Hyperbolic tangent is an odd function. And so again, symmetry, symmetry breeds pitchforks. Now, there is another type of bifurcation uh, associated or that falls under the pitchfork name, and it is called a subcritical. Subcritical bifurcation, okay? Now the subcritical bifurcation, the only real difference is changing the sign right here. So it turns out that this actually makes a big difference. If I change the sign of this thing, then the bifurcation diagram flips. So remember, I have multiple roots when R is positive, okay? Now, if I change the sign here, I have multiple roots when R is negative. And essentially what you get is a bifurcation diagram that looks like this. So you still have X equal to zero being stable when R is negative and unstable when R is positive. But now the branches, they flip and they open backwards and it turns out that they are unstable. So I'm gonna leave that for you to check out on your own. But this is what's called an unstable, or sorry, a subcritical pitchfork bifurcation, okay? Supercritical, stability destabilizes to symmetrically related stable states. Subcritical means that you have a stable fixed point whose stability is completely destroyed by colliding with two things that were unstable, right? These two symmetric unstable branches come down, they collide and they, they destroy everyone's fun because now there's nothing stable anymore. Subcritical bifurcations are, uh, pitch, subcritical pitchfork bifurcations are much more difficult to observe in nature or in natural systems for the very simple reason that here, there's nothing stable. There's nothing that you're going to observe because there's nothing to converge into. Whereas it's much easier to see a supercritical uh, pitchfork bifurcation taking place in a system if you're just observing its dynamics and changing the parameter value because they could just evolve to some trivial steady state, x equal to zero. And then as you cross some critical threshold, you know, then you'll see them sort of um, converge into something completely different, maybe one of these two sort of symmetrically related branches. Whereas here, there's nothing to catch you when R is positive. So you get this sort of unstable branch here where nothing interesting happens. So subcritical bifurcations 
are typically precursors of things like phase transitions, right? Where we get, uh, you know, where the system kind of completely reorients itself because there's no real sort of visible pattern associated to these to these unstable states in this positive parameter range, right? It means that your dynamics have got to go somewhere else because nobody's going to catch them here anymore. Okay, now that we've looked at three different types of bifurcations, saddle node, transcritical, and the super and subcritical pitchforks, let's look at, in the next lecture, what happens when we lose this symmetry, what are called imperfect bifurcations, right? The approximate symmetries. What happens? Do we see ghosts of these pitchfork bifurcations, or does everything just reduce to maybe one of the other cases that we looked at? Well, let's come back to that in the next lecture.